Hi, I'm Joe Roth. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and informing people about our life-saving mission. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Paying for a college education, next on Caucus New Jersey. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by University Hospital, Newark, New Jersey, Wells Fargo, the New Jersey Education Association, PSENG, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, Verizon Communications, and by Adler Aphasia Center, helping stroke and brain injury survivors recover their speech. Promotional support provided by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey, and by Commerce Magazine. Welcome to Caucus, New Jersey. I'm Steve Adubato. You know, Paying for higher education has become one of the most challenging tasks facing students and, of course, parents in our country. Here to discuss how families can plan to save for college, we have our good friend Nancy Blotner. They're all good friends, but Nancy Blotner is the president of Caldwell University. Roger Mashad is a senior vice president at Franklin Templeton Investments. Senator Tom Kane, Jr., last time we had him at the State House in the Senate chamber, today we have him. He is the Senate Minority Leader, and he serves on the Senate Higher Education Committee. And finally, Gabrielle Charette is Executive Director of the Higher Education Student Assistance Authority. Thank you all for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. Incredibly important issue that many of us, many people watching in New Jersey and in the tri-state region struggling with this question. Senator, you deal with this issue not just from a public, public policy perspective with your own children as well, right. which are how old are they? 11 right? and 16. How hard is it for most parents to figure out how to do this? Well, it's incredibly difficult. And every one of the on the federal level, faster than the other forms, penalize savings in, in so many different ways. So even if you're trying to save, all you know, people don't recognize the need to show these income forms every year. You need to apply for the aid every Fat, year. Is it, what do they call the FAFSA it, forms? Yes, and it's it, it, and what it is is it's a federal income verification. So if you're going through any of the financial aid programs, and you need to make sure that you update your income every single year. And what we need to do on the state level is make sure, first and foremost, that the, that the colleges are as affordable as humanly possible. But they also have the tools, management tools, to drive down their own expenses. And that's one of the things that I focused on, for example, where the state funding formula for higher education hasn't changed since 1960, since Rutgers became a state university. Right. Don't you think that there are not only new institutions, but new priorities and programs? We need to make sure that the state that is going out is going out efficiently, efficiently to those institutions that are One doing example. a great job. One example as to how you would change it. Well, we need to figure out, first and foremost, what schools are doing what programs. And there are certain programs like biology or master's programs or PhD programs that are functionally more expensive than history programs. And, I'm, and I was a history major. So you've got to figure out, first and foremost, that what are the graduation rates and what are the barriers to the graduation rates. You would give, you've got to figure out what the costs are for the students who are coming in who may not be prepared, so you've got a remedial problem going on, which makes the overall cost of a lot of these colleges more expensive. Because and the time the student, that these excuse, students, excuse me for interrupting, Senator, right. because the remedial problem or the right. not being ready problem will keep a student in college longer, which makes which, it more which, expensive. Which makes it more expensive, and then they, they can get frustrated, and then as you were talking about in one of your earlier segments, which was the focus saying, the person says, is this really the right thing to do for me to stay sure, in college? Sure, and a good idea with Nancy, and, right. Yes, and building up that cost factor. So you, the person stays in college for longer. The costs build over time. And so right. it's a mutually reinforcing problem. Right. So if you focus on tying together academia, state, uh, profits and nonprofits, parents together right. in a way to make this much more comprehensible, it's, it's better for, for all. And, Roger, let's talk about this because on your end, I mean, Senator approaches it from a public policy mm -hmm. perspective and trying to help right. change laws, mm -hmm. policies. You look at it from a different perspective, but still trying to tackle it, talk about it. Yeah, we're just stressing the fact that people got to save and they've got to start as early as possible and they've got to use the right investment vehicle when saving specifically for college, and that's a 529 college savings plan. 
The 529 plan. That's Talk right. about it, because we've talked about it before on other programs. Make it clear to people. And I always disclose that we have three children planning to go to college one day if we're able to do that. And it's the 529 plan. We have it. And people, and we're, not av we're not advocating for it, but you should check it out. What is it? Well, it allows uh, college savers, typically parents and grandparents, to set money aside. In many cases, systematically, they invest on a monthly basis in an account that grows tax-free. Uh, they've got multiple investment options available, and it allows them over a number of years, even if, that, if they begin when that child is five, seven, even if that, that child is in, a freshman in high school, to put money aside specifically to uh, target uh, their upcoming tuition payments. What about if they don't have college. a lot of money to do it? It doesn't matter. Every, every dollar that they're putting away in saving is a dollar that they will not have to borrow come time uh, when student loans are maybe the only solution to get those children in college. How much difference do you think it makes? I think it makes a huge difference, and I would just add that you can open uh, an account with as little as $25, so you don't have On to have a lot. On the 529 plan. Yes, and I think that's the biggest misconception, is people think that they have to have a huge chunk of money to get started. They don't. Uh, by the way, make it clear what the authority's role is before I go to Dr. Blotner. What is the, your role? Um, we are the uh, are state, state of New agency? Jersey. We are a state agency. We are an independent state authority, um, and we administer all the state aid programs, as well as the 529 and uh, the New Jersey College Loans to Assist State Students program. So we administer our savings program, our need-based aid program, such as tuition aid grant and JSTARS, and our College Loans to Assist State Students program. Hey, by the way, Jackie, hi, our, our uh, senior producer. Jackie, which websites are we putting up so people can get more information? Great. We'll have everything on our website. Go on our website, and we'll make all the linkages here. Doctor, let me ask you this. Senator King was talking about graduation rates. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about the connection between graduation rates and state aid to colleges? Now, you're an independent mm -hmm. university. We okay? are. But then there are state public yes. schools. They get more? There's a formula, right? Th there is a formula, and actually the... Uh, students who attend the independent institutions receive more of the uh, tuition aid grants than the corollaries who go to the publics. And that's to acknowledge the fact that we receive um, less direct uh, subsidy from the state. It tries to balance it out. Yes. So, for example, until a few years ago, um, Caldwell received directly as an institution $800,000 plus toward our operating budget. And that was cut uh, beginning in 2010. And for three years, there was no direct subsidy. So, um, just last year, and we hope in the, the coming year, $41,000. So you can see that the amount that we lost was substantial, and that was the year that I came here. So I'm very well aware of the impact and what we had to do to make all of that work out. So I think that, um, you know, we have a, a graduation rate of 62%. That's over six years. That's... Clarify that. Student comes in. Yes. And within six years... 62% um, of those students graduate, and it's six years because it's always 150% of the time to degree. That's the way it's, it's um, looked at in the state right. and federally. And we feel very good about that, and we need to be aware that as institutions report that, it takes into account only first-time, full-time freshmen. So, for example, if a student transfers into my institution and graduates, that student doesn't count for me or the institution from which he or she transferred. Well, what do they count as? They just don't. And so... Uh, but they graduated. They did, but there's no system that really counts them. And so, for example, our president, the president of the United States, who began at one institution and transferred into another institution, is a, is a statistic that doesn't count toward graduation rates. And no one, by any means, would say that he has not been successful with right. his college education, regardless of your... Um, you know, party affiliation. Sure. So th that's one of the flaws. That's one of the flaws that we have. We also need to think about the fact that sometimes there are life circumstances that uh, require students to take longer to graduate. And I know that there's a tremendous push toward efficiency, three-year degrees, five-year combined bachelor's and master's degrees. And we at Caldwell, like many of the other institutions in the state, offer those, and they're appropriate. But there are students for whom that is completely inappropriate. You already alluded to some of those. Students who come needing remedial preparation, right. for example. Students who are working multiple jobs because they are the heads of families. They're responsible for siblings or for parents. They're going to take longer to, to get their education. But I can tell you on commencement day, they are no less deserving and they are as excited as anyone else, even if it took them longer than six years. But how years. is that tied to affordability? How is that tied to the issue of the economics that the senator talked about? 
Well, I think part of it is that these are statistics that just fall apart. They fall away. And so, you know, whenever we look at statistics about higher education that give people pause, sometimes if you're not in the business of higher education, you don't understand all of the uh, factors that go into that that people are unaware of. People, for example, Steve, talk about debt, debt being a, a trillion dollars. How bad is the student debt problem for most students that graduate? How bad is it? Um, it, it can be extensive, but there are factors that, that are covered over. For example, 33% of students nationwide graduate with no debt. People don't talk about that. Or that 12% of students have only $10,000 worth of debt. Much of the debt of the trillion is uh, attributable to graduate students who are pursuing... Graduate and or medical students. Yes, they're in medical degrees, they're in Law legal degrees. degrees. They expect to have a very substantial earning power that many students don't have. Let's jump in here. Senator, and then I'm coming back to you on the debt problem. How bad do you think the debt problem is? Now, now, Nancy laid out the fact that a lot of people graduate without debt, and a lot of the debt is on the graduate side, the medical school side, the legal side, law degrees. What do you right. think? Well, I think, number one, the, the issue is the amount of debt you have coming out of school sometimes determine, determines what type of job you're looking for. The prospect of when you're applying for financial aid, that the threat of long-term debt may say, maybe this this higher education option is not, is not for me. And so you people make life choices based on information that may or may not be accurate. And so making sure that individuals know coming out of high school or go, transferring between institutions what the potential rates of, of um, interest are, what the types of programs that exist are. And the legislature passed a law uh, last year or the year before to, to do that, to put it out into all these financial aid offices and in the, in the high schools so people would have a better understanding what the cost is. Because it's not only what the real cost is, it's what the perceived cost is. And when you're going into certain majors with the graduation, upon graduation you may have, what type of job do you want? So what I think what we have to do as a legislature, for example, is for those areas where we have some control, it's the funding formula. It should be updated from 1960 or so when Rutgers became the state university. But we should also make sure that the, the board members, for those individuals that are nominated by the governor and confirmed by the state senate, the go-to, some of the state institutions, are the best qualified board members. Are they not we, now? I, I, it depends, I think, on who the individuals are. And I think we, the state senate, have the responsibility, and the colleges and others have responsibility, to make sure that you've got the best, brightest uh, people who are going to look into all the spending practices so you can make sure that these colleges but spend that, sorry, money for Senator, How does that relate directly back to the issue of affordability? Because if you can drive down some of that cost, the growth of the cost of college education, which has increased dramatically over mm. the course of the last several years. Senator, let me ask you this, uh, Roger, as you're listening to the senator. You know, again, public policy decisions have to be made. In an interview I did with uh, Dr. Blotner, she talked about the fact that in a lot of states, it's taking a massive infusion, infusion of public state money, taxpayer dollars, mm -hmm. to accomplish a lot of good things. I don't know if I see that. It's not my place to... But we, to, uh, but we did that with the higher education bond issue. Bond where, issue. Where individuals... Right. For, because what you have to have but, is you need to make sure the institutions have the best science labs, the best classrooms, all those things that they Senator, did not invest for, in for That was for brick years. and mortar, respectfully. Of and that's great, and it was important. Right. We're talking about now for student assistance. Mm -hmm. Those are two different things. Of course. And all I'm asking is this. Mm -hmm. Let's assume for a second there's not going to be a massive infusion in the near future of public money going directly to students for student aid to, to increase affordability. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that. Advice for parents and students who are watching right now saying, well, maybe I'll, I'll help uh, if, if I decide, if we decide that, you know, our kid's going to go to school and the kid wants to go to school, they're just sitting there going, I'm going to pick a major where I think the kid's going to make a lot of money. Does that make sense? Well, I think the 1.2 trillion is is a significant number. Obviously, it's the lar of all of all consumer debt. It's the largest portion of consumer debt outstanding. That's college outside debt. Work. That's college then debt. Then you heard what Dr. Blotner was saying, though. I, I agree that 30 percent have no debt whatsoever, but that 1.2 trillion dollar is what's outstanding. So it's 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 greater than what we'd had ever imagined it would be. But I think the college savings programs are making a big difference in New Jersey. We've accumulated today over $4.7 billion in savings. But I think more importantly, we've made $1.2 billion in distributions towards paying college costs. Explain so the program, that. well, I mean, you can you can judge college savings programs in a number of different ways. And one of them, are you, are you 
encouraging people to save. And we have $4.7 billion in savings accumulated in NJ Best alone. Which but, did not exist before the NJ Best program came into existence. Right. The NJ Best has been in program has been in, in existence now for 13 years. So okay. 13 years of savings. And over that time, we've made distributions towards college costs amounting to more than $1.2 billion. But I think there's a, even a, a, an even more significant issue there. A survey last week released by the College Savings Foundation found that uh, college costs are affecting retirement. It's affecting how long people plan on working beyond what they originally anticipated. And it's requiring them to make changes in terms of what am I going to do in retirement? I might not have as much money accumulated during retirement to make allow me to do all the things that I thought I was going to do. Because of so college debt. It's now rolling, college debt is now rolling into other pe people's lives beyond college and, and uh, student debt. Now, uh, Gabriel, let me ask you this. Roger talked about there's some success we've had with more savings, mm -hmm. but do you have any sense of the percentage of New Jerseyans taking advantage of New Jersey programs? Name them again. Well, the tuition aid grant, in fact, there is actually a massive infusion of state money into state aid programs. The governor is proposing over $400 million for state aid programs for this coming fiscal year, fiscal year 16. Is that a the massive lion's infusion? The lion's share of that going to our tuition aid grant program, which is a need-based program. Tag. That's TAG. Tuition aid grant. Tuition aid grant, over $385.8 million. Who's eligible for that? Nearly one in three New Jersey students attending college in state receives a tuition aid grant. Okay, and the New Jersey <clears throat> Stars program? The New Jersey who's Stars. Who's eligible for that? Any student who achieves the top 15% of his or her high school, junior, or senior year class can receive free community college tuition for t uh, two years. Are most who are eligible for those programs taking advantage of those programs? Um, certainly with the tuition aid grant, uh, we are seeing a tremendous take rate there. With the STARS program, we've seen that uh, start to uh, decline a little bit. Okay. And are loans, should loans be the last option? Loans should always be the last option. And the first, it, when you're talking about loans, the first option should be the federal subsidized loan because that doesn't yes, accumulate, yes, accumulate interest during the, uh, the in-school period. And then other loans... I like state-sponsored loans because I think our programs are geared towards protecting uh, students and families. Okay, I, I gotta ask you this. When President Obama, unless I got this wrong, did President Obama say at a certain point that, that we should be looking toward making, you're shaking your head, Nancy, again, uh, community college is free? Yes. Did he actually say that? Yes, he did. And people are saying, a lot of people are saying, there you go. That will help make things more affordable. Is, who's going to be against that? What's the logical potential problems with that? Senator, you go first. The, the cost of everything from health care to salaries to the funding the institution, obviously. And if you look at all these plans, be given the Affordable Care Act, I mean, New Jersey alone is going to theoretically get taxed $750 million extra a year in about three or four years if we don't change some of the pension and health benefits. So, going hold forward. on, so hold it's, on. It's going to reinforce a, a higher cost for everybody. What is, what is the president proposing free college for students who qualify, I believe, for, free college for go to, going to community college? What does that have to do with the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, and pension and health benefits? What does that have to do with that? Because that's all built into the cost. I mean, the, the, all those costs accrue and add to um, what the cost of going to college is on, at any level. And so what you have to make sure for these administrators is they are able to negotiate with the people who work for these institutions that are 80% or more of the cost, <laughs> that you try to bring down the overall cost of those, those uh, managerial costs. Is that costs. real, Nancy? Those it, costs, how those, real? Those costs are very real and, and something that really drive our budgets. Mm -hmm. And so it goes back to something I said earlier, uh, when we were discussing this, and that is that, you know, so much of our budgets are fixed. And so people have the impression that if you're uh, the president of a private institution, a faith-based institution, that we're really dealing Yours. with... Yours. Yes, Caldwell, as an example, but not the mm -hmm. only, um, that we're very affluent. We have a small endowment. A bunch of rich and, kids go there, you say? <clears throat> 
uh, we have a few that come from affluent families, but 40% of our students are, are from the most challenging of socioeconomic environments. We have a very diverse population. We have hundreds of students who qualify for TAG and for Pell, and we're very proud of that because it's part of our mission as a Catholic Dominican institution. We want to serve that clientele, and we have a very small margin, very small margin for error. You know, one of the things, going back to the earlier conversation that we've done, is we've partnered with an entity called SALT. It's not an acronym, but it's an entity that Caldwell pays to provide a financial literacy curriculum to our students. And so they really have an opportunity to determine if they're going to borrow and from whatever source they're going to borrow, what is that going to look like when they begin to pay back? How much are they going to pay back? Right. How much of that is in principle? How much of it is in an interest over how long of a period of time? And we find that students and their families are making much better decisions and there's a much lower default among our cohort because they're much better informed from a financial literacy perspective mm. going into the taking of the loan. Stay on that. Isn't it fair to say mm -hmm. that part of financial literacy is planning for college education like there, there was uh, one of our friends recently was saying they were going to a, a, a christening of a child and a friend said to me what should I give the child and I immediately I said would you know what the 529 is and I don't I'm sorry for I don't, I don't mean to make this a plug for for the 529 I said well why don't you give the kid something for his college education and he said what are you talking about he's a baby I said well are the parents able to just write a check so the kid can go wherever the kid wants to go I said, what are you talking about? I said, well, when do you think you start planning for the kid to go to school? And I didn't want to be a downer, but they wanted to get, like, you know, some other toy for the kid. I'm thinking, when do you plan, Roger? Isn't that part of financial literacy? Well, I think uh, financial literacy for students is important in middle school and high school. They should be get a better understanding of what taking on this student debt means. And at the end of the day, what does t borrowing Thirty thousand dollars on average for college. Well, those are for kids. What road. about for parents? Well, parents as well, obviously. And I think um, there's a lot of great tools available at franklintemblin.com, at njbest.com, calculators and tools to help you understand what this means. But it all, they also help you understand if you have a baby and you're saving seventy-five dollars or twenty-five dollars or hundred dollars a month over fifteen years or eighteen years, what that accumulation may very well be. So the tools are there. It's just continuing to promote the idea that be proactive, start early save systematically and use the right savings vehicle. And, and Senator, what can or is the state doing or could they do more to support savings? Because I don't know what the tax issues or what the well, implications are. We always want to make it more affordable. So to the extent that you can have um, deductions as, 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 best, as best you can for education, for growing that opportunity, that's the best approach always. So making sure that the state's more affordable in every capacity and that money that we do spend is being spent efficiently, but there's also incentives for everything from charitable deductions would be right. one thing that would be help. I think a lot of people around the state of New Jersey, which we don't actually d deduct charitable contributions from your income tax. We're we do not. States. We do not. We're one of the few states that don't. So I think that have an income tax. So I think things like that would help institutions, nonprofits, and, sure. and uh, across to make the state even more affordable than it currently is. By the way, real quick, uh, Dr. Blattner, tell folks the name of the commission you're serving on, which just has had one meeting so far. We, we did a one-on-one -on -one interview uh, with Nancy for our capital report program, and we talked about it. Just name of the name of the commission. Commission on Affordability in Higher Education. In the state of New Jersey, and it's yes. dedicated to doing what? Taking a look at all of the ways that we in the higher education community can come together and make uh, a higher educational experience more affordable for the citizens of New Jersey. Got it. Gabrielle, let me ask you this. I know your job is not prognosticating. <laughs> Next five to ten years, do you think it's realistic to believe that the cost of higher education in the state of New Jersey will go up considerably? I don't think it's going to go up considerably. I, I think everyone realizes, I think, and that's why this, this commission has, has been formed. I think everyone realizes that you can't just keep this, this escalation and something has to be done. Mm -hmm. So I think that you're going to see increases, but I don't think it's going, they're going to be uh, massive you increases. Don't. No, I don't. Make the argument in the, in the minute or so we have left. College is, for those who are saying, eh, I don't think so, it's not worth it, the ROI, return on investment. <clears throat> Make the case, Roger. 
Oh, I think just the, the experience alone, an 18-year-old with a two-year or four-year college experience makes them a much more productive member of the workforce once they decide exactly what they want to do. I don't think they have any idea what they want to do at age 18. I think beyond that, the, the higher level of income earnings, some half a million to a million dollars in additional earnings over their lifetime with a college degree is significant, something they should keep in mind. Senator, make the case. Ditto. I mean, that's exactly on point. We make sure that you can be a much more valuable um, addition to your own future and your family's future. Do you think you'd be where you are doing what you're doing if you didn't have the education you have? No, not at all. Nancy? Well, I think we have a choice. We either have an educated citizenry or we have an uneducated citizenry, and I don't think we can afford to have the latter. So it's, it's true that it helps the individual, but it helps society as well. We fill jobs. They're better jobs. People who have a college education are more civic-minded. They vote. They uh, volunteer. They, they give uh, service. And also, they tend to engage in healthier lifestyles, which uh, releases a burden on the medical system. Gabrielle, I'm going to assume that you agree. I absolutely agree. Okay. Your education is an investment in yourself that you have for your lifetime. Well said. Uh, thank you all for making the case for college education. We have to figure out how to make it more affordable for everyone. The Thanks. preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence, and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by University Hospital, Newark, New Jersey, Wells Fargo, the New Jersey Education Association, PSE&G, MD Advantage, Verizon Communications, and by Adler Aphasia Center. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. Hi, I'm Linda Bowden. Aphasia is a language disorder that occurs from a stroke or a brain injury. My dad had a neurological disorder that no one could diagnose. Although his intellect was intact, his speech was getting worse. Then we learned he had aphasia and we saw firsthand how isolating it can be. It is possible to help those with aphasia improve their communication skills and regain the confidence to live their lives fully. If you or a loved one has been diagnosed with aphasia, there is hope.